All right, let's get started. All right, thanks for coming, everyone. This is Configuration Management on Managed Workflow. My name's Moshe Weitzman. I'm a longtime Drupal contributor, uh, now working for Acquia as the uh, Director of Research and Development. Um, my co-presenter here, Matt Cheney, um, is a distinguished Drupal community member for many years um, and uh, founded Chapter 3 and Pantheon. Um, so uh, Matt's going to kick us off. Awesome, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. As Moshe said, my name's Matt Cheney. I work at Pantheon. Moshe works at Acquia. Hopefully that shows you the importance and the like really awesomeness that is configuration management. That I know you're all here because hopefully your favorite feature in Drupal 8 is configuration management. It's certainly mine. It's certainly Moshe's. And we think that this is going to bring in a sort of new day for developers. It's going to allow a lot of really awesome new things to happen in Drupal. And it's something that is, in fact, going to happen in about two weeks. That if you saw Dries's keynote this morning, I hope you were all there. We will have an RC1 in two weeks' time. The long wait is over. We'll have that release candidate. And the next time we gather together for DrupalCon, be it in Mumbai or in New Orleans, we'll be using the kind of technology and techniques that we we'll talk about in this presentation on a regular basis. And that's awesome, because this is something that, for sort of a little bit of throat clearing, if you had been at DrupalCon Amsterdam, I gave a similar kind of talk on configuration management and it was sort of like, hey, it's all happening then. Um, we've updated this talk, of course, added a little motion magic, added some new updates. But that, you know, this is, a, this is my favorite feature of Drupal 8. It's all happening, and I think it's going to create Drupal 8 as a professional and really robust w content management system that fits modern development practices and lets you, me, and everyone in this room build really awesome sites. So just with that... I'll sort of put that out there. This is awesome. I'm super excited about it. I hope you are too. The goal of your pres presentation is to make you be like, configuration management is awesome. I want to use this for all my projects right now. And it's important because configuration management solves a sort of problem that has existed in Drupal more or less since the beginning, that we have a world of content management system where you really have these two different things. On one hand, we have the configuration of the website. That's sort of the feeds and speeds that make the website as awesome as it is. It's the content types that define what kind of data we're storing. It's the image styles that define sort of how the graphics will be presented, the different fields on the data, the listings of the data, and any of the settings that you click to make Drupal do the kinds of things that you want. And this is awesome. This is actually one of the really powerful things about Drupal is that we as developers basically can click our way and work our way into building a pretty awesome site. And that's the configuration. That's done by professionals who more or less understand Drupal as part of their development process. On the other hand, we have the content of the website, the blog posts, the comments, the taxonomy terms, the user profiles. These are the things that get put in by the end users, by the people who are using the websites as editors or people who are logging in to check it out. And this is also a really good strength of Drupal. This is an interactive kind of living website. It's why a lot of folks choose Drupal as their solution. And for every individual Drupal site, we've got that configuration that's done by developers, and we have that content done by end users. And now there's a little bit of gray area in the middle, some things that are config, sort of our content, and vice versa. But there's a separation that I hope you all can see in this um, situation. The, the problem, though, and this gets into sort of this talk around managed workflow, is that when we're building a modern website, we don't just have one version of the site that we add the content and edit the code on. We have a workflow that looks something like this. I hope this is familiar to folks in the room, that you are having a development environment, one or several, that you actually are going to write code, you're going to do configuration, you're going to build the things that people want in that environment. 
And then you have a live environment, which is actually what people are seeing on the internet when they go to your site. And then you have a test environment in the middle that sort of looks at you know, reviewing it before it goes live. And as you see from sort of the diagram here, the code, which is the red line, starts in dev, moves to test, and then to live. And then the content, the stuff that we want sort of to test against and work, is obviously added to live and needs to go back to dev and back to test as appropriate. And this, a lot of modern sort of web platforms will do something like this for us, for the content. But when they say content, what they really mean is database. That if I'm refreshing my dev environment, that means copying the database from live to dev. The problem here is that the configuration of this site is caught up in that content store. It's in the database right now in Drupal 7. And this is a sort of a problem because Drupal doesn't really care in Drupal 7 world about having the configuration be separated. Here's a bunch of tables from a Drupal 7 site. Some of the tables are configuration tables. Some are content tables. And this creates a situation where I can't just, if I want to update my my dev site, I can't just take all of the stuff from live because it might overwrite a view that I have or overwrite some configuration that I've done. And this is a problem because I want to be able to do all my work in dev. I want to be able to push it to test. I want to push it to live um, without having to like worry a lot about, you know, is it going to work, et cetera, et cetera. And that luckily, we do have some solutions to this problem. I assume most of us in the room who are interested in configuration management are probably used to using one of these two methods right now. That we have a very powerful function, hook update n, that will allow us, when we do updates to our site, to run any amount of Drupal code that we think is appropriate. We can set configuration, we can modify values, we can do a lot of stuff. And that's really cool. That actually will, in fact, let us put configuration in code. I've seen some projects that have literally thousands of these kind of update hooks because they're doing a lot of updating every single time. The problem, though, is that hook update n, it requires a lot of work. You have to write each update function yourself. You have to test it yourself. You have to use the Drupal API, and it can get a little crazy. This is just an example from a, a module that just sets a bunch of variables. That's a pretty simple case. Doing more gets to be a little bit wild. We also have on the, uh, on the right features module, which I personally love. I know it can get some bad raps in the community, but I think it, it creates a solution to a problem, which is features module does try to get us into this world where we can put all of the configuration that we've done on the site, the content types, the field groups, the image styles, et cetera, into, uh, into, into code. And that's cool. There are a lot of successful Drupal projects that use features to put their configuration into code. And that's cool. The problem, though, uh, and this I aside from last year, but I love it so much, is that features wasn't set up to be a management solution for like all your site's configuration. That was not what it was supposed to do that it was set up to be like a, a tool to like share like packaged like image gallery or slideshow or, or blog system or news system in your site. It was, it was made for a Drupal distribution called Open Atrium, which is fabulous, but it was designed to be sort of a way to share stuff within Atrium. Um, but it had this opportunity to grow into something bigger because it did in fact put content types and, and views and stuff into code in a somewhat unified way. The problem, though, is that it ends up getting blamed for a lot of problems, sort of like uh, this is Commander Worf from Star Trek, much like Worf got blamed, his father's got blamed for a lot of problems uh, at Kinemer, is that features is a contrib module. It's not a core solution. So it's constantly trying to work around what Drupal core will provide. And there's limitations in Drupal core about putting stuff in code. The Drupal core doesn't, by default, doesn't use UUIDs to reference various things. It uses incremental IDs. 
Well, the problem is that if I have a dev site that has an incremental ID and a live site that has an incremental ID, they may not be the same, which will cause me problems. The other thing is that features module, because it's supporting a bunch of other contrib modules that all are doing the config in sort of their own way, features module sort of has to, you know, work with views, it has to work with core, it has to work with a lot of different kinds of modules to make it all work right. And it's constantly chasing those modules. The module updates, it changes its format a bit, features has to change. And this creates a little bit of confusion. So if you use features, you're definitely familiar with, you know, little variations of the code, sort of struggling to get it all right. Um, I was talking to someone yesterday who was, or two days ago, who had had a site that didn't have features on it, and they were tasked over the course of like six weeks to put it all into features. And he's a smart guy, he has a good team, they worked on it, they said they got 95% of it right um, into features. And I was like, oh man, like, like, well, it's a complicated site, a lot of things, a lot of custom stuff. But that's a real problem. That's sort of a legacy kind of problem of this config and content not being the same thing. And this causes us trouble for developers. Drupal 8, obviously, is going to be a little bit better. And I say that because, so one of the things in, in Klingon society is that if you're like a Klingon and you get dishonored, like it's not just your dishonor. Your dishonor extends for, for seven generations into your family. But I feel now with Drupal 8, in the eighth version, we can be free of this sort of, you know, distinction. We can move on from that and we can have a solution for creating configuration and code that doesn't take six weeks, three sprints. That's just one button, export all the config. And sort of how we got there, how we have this system, starts with uh, Pinball Wizard, Greg Dunlap in 2011, who basically came to the Drupal 8 process and said, we need to put our configuration in code. Because Greg's a smart developer, he's worked at a lot of big Drupal companies, a lot of big Drupal projects, used features, and he saw that the solutions that we had in, in the Drupal 7 world were inadequate. We needed a great solution to put all of the configuration in code and have it be a core solution that's there by default, that everyone has to use, that makes it easy and consistent. And he got a lot of help from a lot of smart people. People like David Strauss, Alex Pott, Matthew Tift, XJM, Tim Plunkett, The Sun, all came together and sort of brainstormed a lot of ideas. Like, how are we going to do this? And how are we going to make this work over the next three years? And they looked at a lot of inspirations, things like Jenkins, that has a, a pretty cool configuration export option. And they basically said, what do we want to do? We want something fun. We want to put all the configuration and code in a standard way. So what we need it to be the YAML time. So I know these are camels. Um, but the idea and sort of the, the crux of the Drupal 8 configuration system is that on, on the sort of data level, it is possible to take any value that is put into Drupal as configuration and export it out into a YAML file. And a YAML file, I'll show you it in just a second, but it's just a structured data file. It works like XML um, in that respect. And what's really awesome about YAML is that it also exists in just one place. That in the world of features, you can sort of have multiple features that have the same value for the same, or the same value but like different values, and it can have conflicts and overrides and stuff like that. In the case of configuration management, you have just one place that keeps all of your configuration, and you have this sort of, this sort of authoritative version. So here's the YAML file for the, the, the system information um, uh, field settings in Drupal, that you have a title for the site, Drupal 8 CMI demo, for example. That when you put that into a YAML file, that is the configuration, is the configuration, is the configuration. It uses a model called declarative configuration that says, for system site, yeah, system site name, that's the value, you know, full stop. And that's really awesome, because we can now have this, like, central place that defines all the configuration. That we can take a form like this, that has all the site information. You know, this should be familiar to developers uh, or folks using Drupal. You have the different fields. These do different things in Drupal. They all can be represented here in this YAML file. And YAML was chosen for a lot of reasons. Um, Symphony really likes it, which is good. But also, it's pretty readable. Like, if you compare this to, like, features code, for example, night and day difference. This is, is pretty clean. It diffs really well if you sort of look at it in a, in a sort of diff situation. And it's the kind of sort of human readable formats that we, we, sort, of, we sort of like. 
I did a work for a sort of simple page like something like this, but we can also have other kinds of things, settings in it. In fact, we have all the settings in it. Here's the uh, blog type on the left. Uh, this is you know, type of blog, you know, description, this kind of thing. And then we have a field on the right. And you can sort of tell from some of these values, these are the things that you would be setting, setting in the UI. In fact, you have files for everything in the website. This is actually just Drupal core for Drupal 8, all the different files. And you can sort of see the, the pattern, you know, system.something.yaml. And these are sort of separated out for, for what's happening. And so this is how we store configuration in, in Drupal 8. Um, it's by design, works pretty well, and it's awesome. Because the great thing about having your configuration in files versus a database, let's say, is that I can put this in version control. I can deploy this as part of my workflow. I can make this something that I have a commit hash for, that I can do tests against, that I can be engaged with. That this, the configuration works the same way, the commit, the code, as, as theme changes I make, as module updates I make, and stuff like that. And that's really powerful. That allows a lot of things you'll see in Moshe's demo and the benefits of what we're doing. So does that, does that jive with people? We pumped? It's good? OK. Like that, I like that, I like that energy. I know, it's, I know it's morning, I know we're following Dries, which is a hard act also, but I'm tall, so I'll, I'll pull, do the best I can. Okay, so all our stuff's in, in files, that's great. So like, what about the database? Like, how do we use the database in configuration management? So this actually changed a little bit. The original design for configuration management just had the stuff in files, and that was how you did it. Problem is, reading like all these files can be sort of expensive, not always best, so the way that you use the database in configuration management is that the database is sort of your runtime data store. That you, when you sort of save values from the web form, it doesn't just write files every single time. It actually puts it into the database. It's sort of your runtime configuration. It's only when you actually use the import-export operations that most will show you that you actually then push it out to the file system. And the place where it goes in the file system is defined in settings. P or is defined um, in settings.php. Basically, here is the directory that the configuration will live. All this, all this stuff goes in to a place you define in settings.php. By default in Drupal 8, it's been it's put into the files directory. It's uh, files config underscore, then it has like an M time kind of security hash. And that works for the sort of minimum use case. If you're just on a shared host or something that's not using version control, you can still install Drupal 8, you can still have all the files sort of be pushed out or config pushed out in the files directory, totally works. But the problem is something in the files directory is typically not put in version control. We don't want to do that. So what you can do is you can take, uh, define your sort of config directory's value to say, hey, I want my config at, for example, site's default config, and I'm gonna put all the config there. And then that's something that now can be put into version control, and it could be you know, set up as, as, a, as something to, to look into your managed workflow. And this is the power of configuration management. The ability to say, I'm gonna treat a click on my view the same way as I treat a custom module that I wrote. They both exist in code, they both have get, it, get, ha get hashes, and they can both work through a managed workflow. So. That's sort of my razzle-dazzle that started off. Turn it over to Mosh to actually show you how this stuff works. And then we'll go in and do a little more talking about some of the benefits. But let's go. OK. Matt's taller than I am. Um, OK, so uh, you know we, we covered some of this. But uh, there's real magic in the workflow here. Um, here we see, uh, we start out with a dev site. Um, you can export from that dev site. Um, that will put YAML files onto your file system into the staging directory, wherever you've mapped that to in settings.php. Um, and then over on your, lev on your live site, um, you go ahead and do a configuration import. And that's the moment when your live site starts recognizing the configuration that you've put into Git. OK. Uh, right here. Oh, we lost our animation in our like three transfers. We 
Um, okay, cool. Let's keep going. All right, so let's try this live. Um, I had a minor panic attack when Holly said none of your demos should be done on live uh, during the keynote. Um, I did plan on using uh, Acquia Cloud for this demo. Um, I think I'm going to just uh, do it locally. I was working furiously during Dries' keynote to get everything working locally. Um, so yes, this is a talk about managed workflow, but it's also a talk doing conference Wi-Fi that's awful. So everything's going to be local in my machine. Uh, you got to take my word for it that this works uh, perfectly on Pantheon. It works perfectly on Acquia Cloud, um, and other managed workflow environments should uh, handle it just fine. Okay, cool. Let's do this. Okay. Uh, here I am at my terminal. Let's make the prompt a little smaller. Um, I'm on my local machine in a Drupal site um, called D8. The directory is called D8. You can see there at the bottom. Oh, yeah, you, you hopefully can see. Um, is the font big enough for people? Good? Okay, I get thumbs up in the back. Um, okay, so let's call this my development site. The other local site that I'll show you in a minute is the uh, testing site. All right, and I'm going to show you how to move configuration from uh, development to testing, um, and then testing to live would be the exact same process, okay? Um, okay, so uh, the first thing uh, that I've done as a setup is I've installed Drupal. I have done a config export of my installed Drupal, so that means my staging directory is populated with hundreds of YAML files. Um, I have gone ahead and added that staging directory, site's default config, to my Git repository. Um, so that's now uh, being managed by Git, okay? Uh, it's the same Git repository as the one that's managing code, okay? So the solution that we're recommending for managed workflow is there's only one repository. Right, in case people weren't clear about that. Um, okay. Uh, it's like, let's get rid of this. Okay. Um, let's export from this site, or let's make a configuration change. There it is. Okay, so uh, we're now looking at the UI for the configuration uh, management module in Drupal 8. This is a core module. Everyone's going to have it. Um, you can see um, three tabs here. Um, one tab, which I'll show you, but uh, I don't necessarily encourage you to use it, is the single uh, export and import. But I think it's helpful to at least know about it and know what it does. So you can take any of the YAML files um, or any of the configurations and just get them using the UI, okay? Get all these values. Um, if you care to, you can actually make changes on your site. I just changed that from 5 to 10. And I don't remember what the name of it was that I had, actually. So that's not going to work too well. Let's do it again. I'm on import. Contact dot settings. Exporting. Now importing. I will. Okay, so if you don't like the Drupal forms, you can use other Drupal forms. Um, so uh, full import and full export is closer to what we're recommending for um, managed workflow. Um, 
what these uh, tabs provide is you can go ahead and get all of your configuration as a tarball, okay? Um, it's useful. You can see it downloading there um, at the bottom of my screen. Um, now, let's say if I have, uh, like this is one way to go from production, you grab a tarball, and you take it to your dev site, and you can put it in the directory, the staging directory, and commit that, and now you have taken all of the stuff that was done in production and put it into your Git code. So um, it's a handy tab. Um, and uh, similarly, you can import one of these tarballs using the UI if you care to. Um, the way that uh, we hope people are going to use this is actually to use a few Drush commands that we've added. Um, so if you're using the latest version of Drush, um, Drush 8, uh, you will find um, a bunch of, of config commands. The ones that I'm going to show are called config export and config import. Okay. Okay. I am changing the site name. Don't get too excited. Uh, the new site name for this dev site is Barsa. Okay. Um, here we see uh, that there's two changes about to be committed to, um, that are about to be overwritten in my staging directory by the config export command. One of them is a foo configuration change, which is something I did for Matt right before this example. It's okay to leave it like that. Um, the other one is the one we just made, system.site. Um, that is a file that exists already that's being updated, okay? So Drush is providing you a preview of what's about to happen to your staging directory. We say yes to confirm it. Um, all of the, what, the YAML files from the runtime database got exported to the staging directory, okay? Um, okay, so we see that uh, there's one modified file, um, sites default config system.site.yaml, all right? So Git has told me that there's one pending modification. Let's go ahead and commit it. I didn't need to push it because that's actually the master repo in the local. Okay, so um, we now have made a, a config change and we have pushed it to Git, okay? So uh, this is um, terrific. Now we go over to the next site, which is the testing site, and we do a Git pull to get our new code and a config import to um, have that um, new code be recognized by the runtime, all right? I switched over to the other site, that's D8 test, okay? Um, and continuing in our terminal with Drush. Bummer. That's what happens with demos that are, that are uh, pushed too quickly. Okay, so what I was expecting to see there is that, um, oh, I didn't pull, thanks. <laughs> Someone was looking quizzically out there and gave me a clue. Okay, that's better. Um, okay, so uh, Drush is telling me that, uh, is it okay, do you really want this change before it goes into the runtime? Um, and it gives me a clue that um, it's system.site that's being changed. Um, Drush actually has another um, option for viewing the preview. You can actually see the code that's going to go in. I'll show you that. So if I say no here, add the option dash dash preview equals diff. I get a diff, okay, um, with the usual um, unified plus minus stuff that says the site name is changing to Barsa. Okay, if I say yes,
Drupal's working. All right, imported successfully. Okay, so. Um, the site name is changing from um, site install to Bartasa, we hope. There it is, right up here, okay? So um, that was using two Drush commands, only two, all right? Um, it's not a ton of things you have to learn. Um, and uh, we have sort of had Drush and Git doing a happy interaction here, uh, such that we're taking that staging directory and using it as a way to move configuration through sites. All right, um, so uh, that's really the demo. I'm gonna switch back to the slides. Uh, I'm, I have a little more time. I'm actually gonna do uh, more complex, um, just to show you something more exciting than the site name. Um, so uh, let's go back to our dev site. What I've done just there is I created the blog content type, okay? I've added a picture, an image field uh, called pick to the blog content type. So what I'm doing right now is creating a view that's showing all of the blogs, okay? So what I'm simulating here is like a whole feature um, that I've created on this dev site. Um, it's a blog content type, it has an image field, it has a body field, um, and it has a view that shows the data, okay? If I go over to um, my terminal now, uh, switch over to the... dev site, I'm gonna do an export, okay? So all the work I've been doing on my dev site, I now need to export it so I can get it to Git. All right, that's your next step once you're ready. I'm gonna show you a new option here, um, dash dash commit, all right? So um, if you're feeling kind of confident, um, you can have Drush go ahead and do the commit for you. Um, so it's doing the Drush work and the Git work for you, all right? We're still gonna get um, our prompt from Drush to say, is everything looking okay? Um, and you can see all the stuff that, all the YAML files that are getting created uh, based on that blog feature I just made, all right? I'm creating the node type, obviously, uh, a body, a picture, um, more picture stuff, and um, then the form modes and the display modes that got created um, for my blog content type, and finally at the end, the view, all right, the configuration entity that is the view. So all that stuff is about to go into Git. If I say yes, oh, it just did it. Cool. I think dash dash commit means keep going. Um, okay, so just to show you, this is the last commit on my repo. Um, you can see that um, Drush went ahead and made a nice um, commit message that is basically the whole preview. Um, it put it in there, and so if people are curious about what the, get, the commit it has in it, um, they can go look at that commit message. Um, and just scrolling through the commit, you see that it's a bunch of YAML. All Okay, so switch to the um, testing site, the next site in the workflow. Did a git pull this time, and now my staging directory is up to date. All right. Um, I didn't, oh, something, it said something wrong. 
um, untracked would be overwritten. I don't care about that file. That's okay. Yeah. For now. <laughs> um, sites default files HD access? Yeah. Sites default config. Easy for you guys. You don't have everyone looking at you. Um, okay. So did the poll really work or no? Now it worked. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and import. All right. It's not sufficient to just move your code over. You have to import it to bring it into the runtime. Uh, I had an idea to do it differently this time. Okay, so uh, here we're uh, in the um, configuration UI uh, that Drupal provides on our test site. Okay, um, so there is a tab here called Synchronize, which I didn't show before. Uh, the point of Synchronize is it looks at um, your staging directory and sees what's different from what's in your runtime. Okay, so uh, an alternative to running um, config import is to just do a synchronize using the UI. So let's go ahead and try that here so you see all the different options that are provided by Drush and by Core. Um, you get a preview of what's coming. Uh, you can see the blog content type is coming along with the image field and the view and all that stuff. So import all is our only option, so let's go ahead and do that. Hope for the best. Um, failed. Oh, foo is invalid. Yeah, that was a dodgy thing that I did um, by putting in something that has no module recognizing it. Um, so uh, I shouldn't have done that right before um, getting on here. Let's just see if uh, Drush config import will care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't do it, same, same error. Okay, um, all right, so uh, now you have almost seen a complex feature moving from dev to stage, okay? Um, all right, so let's go back to our slides. No, let's go back to our slides. All right, you can get the, your speaker notes going when you need them. All right, uh, hopefully the demo was cool. It was mostly cool. Um, you, you even got to see me make a few mistakes, which is kind of exciting. Um, let's, let's go back to the top level um, and see what the benefits are um, of the configuration management on managed workflow. All right, uh, I think this is the biggest one. Um, there is finally accountability and auditability of uh, what's happening with the configuration on your website, okay? Uh, we are using Git. You know, the world's best accountability and auditability tool. Um, it doesn't forget anything, um, and it knows exactly who made what configuration changes, okay? Um, config import and config export are very scriptable operations, okay? Um, with scriptability, we finally get the things like configuration, uh, uh, continuous integration, all right? Um, it's quite easy now to... Um, just have config import and export as part of your routines. Um, and we can, you know, be testing our pull requests on our CI systems and all that kind of stuff. Um, since this is Git, you can roll back to a prior configuration. Um, if something went wrong, uh, let's say you weren't doing full testing, which certainly happens, um, something went wrong, you can roll back to a prior configuration. Um, I will say your mileage may vary. Um, simple uh, rollbacks are pretty simple. Uh, complex rollbacks are still hard. You know, configuration management solves some of our problems, but not all of them. Um, okay, so uh, I'll hand it over to Matt here, uh, and you'll hear about uh, the live environment. Hey, 
Yay for the demo. Yay for configuration management. Um, so I think this is really cool. I think having a unification of Git and your configuration like makes the kinds of things that Moshe just showed and talked about possible. That we can have the, configura the continuous integration run on all the commits. We can have a lot of confidence in our development process. And we can use this to do really, honestly, better and more awesome stuff. And I think that's part of the Drupal story, is we continually build tools and techniques to make bigger and better and more awesome websites for everyone. I think configuration management is part of that story. There are a couple things that I want to sort of point out sort of in closing before we do some questions. Just so like when we show demos and sort of show the simple cases, they help to show you how this kind of stuff works. There's you do your config in dev, you push to test, you deploy live. Like that totally works. But there's this thing called the real world we live in where this isn't always the case. And this is specifically not the case when we're talking about sort of, uh, say, a, a deployed project where we have a client or a customer or someone who wants to also make changes to the live environment. So say we have a website. Customer has, has, you know, has paid for it, has worked on it. Um, they're like, I'm just going to edit views in, in production. This is what Drupal's for. You know. um, and they're going to go do a bunch of config on the live environment. If you as a developer don't realize that or don't care about that, and you then go to make, make some new, new stuff on dev, push it to test, and import it to live, what you effectively do is blow away all their work. This is a problem. Um, and that this is something that sort of configuration management doesn't really, because it's declarative, it has a hard time doing this. That if you make a commit that says the value for this is this in dev, you push it to test, you push it to live, and you import, live's just going to accept that value. It's not going to be like, oh, like somebody changed this two days ago. What's going on? So, but there are ways to deal with this. And there's sort of three ways I'll show you of how to deal with a situation where configuration changes have happened in the live environment and also in your dev environment. What do you do? Well, first option is you can just say no. I was going to use the slide of Nancy Reagan in the 80s, her anti-drug campaign, but I don't know if that works in Europe. Um, but there, uh, there uh, is, a, is a sort of best practice, good practice that says, look, you can't make, you can't edit, you shouldn't edit your theme or your module code in live. You shouldn't edit your config either. Like, just don't do it. Push it through the workflow, run it through the test. Like, this is best. And luckily, there's a Drupal 8 module for it. Uh, mod, uh, project config read only. It's um, being worked on this week. It's not super crazy as a module. It basically just says, hey, if you put something special in your settings file that says only have config read only, don't let people do config. So if you install this module and you like turn it on your live site, and then you know someone goes in and tries to edit a view, it'll be like, no, no, no. You must do that in dev. And I like this approach. I actually think it's pretty good for discipline. I think that's how you should work with a website. You shouldn't do the changes in live. So that's option one. Just say no. Use something module like this. Force the changes to go through dev. Problem is, that doesn't always work for everyone. Some people do want to do config in live. OK, OK. Option two. Oh, this also is animated, but it was from Windows, so it's not that great. Um, so option two is you can have this process where if you're on dev and you're doing some work, you can sort of export out your config from dev, and then you can sort of refresh your dev environment. So you can take like the, like the, the database from live and put it in your dev site. And then you can um, do a config export again. This is sort of how it commonly works now with features and such. Like if you do have changes, you can pull it back to dev, put it into code. And whoa, whoa. And, uh, and, th and there's some commands for that. There's a really great Drush command, SQL sync, that'll bring your database back. MySQL dump, of course, will do that. And then as a developer, you can do this process where you can sort of like set your changes aside, bring in the live, and then put it together yourself. And then you can push it up through the workflow. And I feel this is probably going to be the most common way people handle this problem. You know, because the developers were used to refreshing our dev environments, and we'll go, we'll go push, the, push the code in that way. The problem is that we can run into some issues where we don't want to overwrite config. So if you do have something in live and something in dev, and they're sort of both existing, you got to be sort of careful when you do this. So there's also an option three, uh, which is just use magic to do this, which is great. Um, 
there's a, there's a new Drush command uh, called config merge that uh, is available at Drush Ops config extra. And it's basically a command that says, if I'm using Drush and I can specify my live environment with like a Drush site alias, and I'm running it on my local environment, it'll actually go in and, and do a really cool operation. It'll say, let's connect to the live site, let's export the config off the live site, let's bring it into local, let's export the config from local, and then we'll just take the two configs and we'll try to merge them together. And often this will work, no problem. We got a view edited on live, developers made a new content type. No conflicts, we'll just put them both in and commit them all at once. In the case where we do have some conflicts, which we will, um, this will bring up a, a, a visual diffing tool, kdiff3, and it'll actually say, okay, like, hey, the view's been changed in live and in dev, how do we want to reconcile this? And then we can actually make the decisions we want to make and do commits. So this is a little more advanced. You have to sort of set up the Drush aliases. You have to have SSH and Git access to the server. Um, but it's something that I think is really cool. And if you're interested in sort of being using configuration management and you have changes in live and changes in dev, or for what it's worth, you have two or three developers that are all working on the same stuff, you can use Drush config merge to move, merge another developer's, you know, her, she's working over here. I can take her stuff and merge it with my stuff as well. So definitely, definitely point people to check out Drush config merge. Sort of works like magic, which is awesome, but it is code. You can see it as well. And hopefully one of those three options will work to handle cases with, with live, um, live config. The second sort of last uh, thing that um, sort of can be an issue is, is sharing of configuration. Sharing is super cute, as my graphic suggests. Um, and it's something that we want to do, that part of the Drupal ethic is sharing the work you have. We want people to do cool config and share it with other people. It's, you know, part of like sharing code and such like that. The problem or challenge is that Drupal 8's configuration system wasn't actually designed for sharing very well. That if you take this as the export of all the YAML files, if I install Drupal 8, do a cool config, and then be like, hey, this config's awesome, and I export it all out and send it to you, if you go spin up a Drupal site and import it in your site, it's going to give you an error. It's like you can't use another site's config. True story. And there's some reasons for that. Um, but it, it makes it a little bit difficult because I just can't take config from one and put it in the other very easily. Um, but we can do it. So, but this is a challenge we deal with. So one option that we can do to deal with is um, the drush config import command has a dash dash partial option. Um, that'll soon be available at this URL, uh, the Drush 8, 8, 8, it's only in the 8 branch, which isn't yet a Drush commands, but it will, when it will be, it'll be there. And the cool thing about partial is that say I make a really awesome blog, blog system. I've got five fields, I've got a content type, I've got a view. I could export just those pieces, and I could end up with like five or six of these files. I could post them on my blog and say, hey, did you like this system? Do you want it yourself? You could put those files into a directory run drush um, config import dash dash partial, and it'll actually pull all that stuff into your repository. And it will just work with those files. It'll just add that content type, that view. It won't be like, oh, there's not all the other content types, so delete everything, which is what Drupal would normally do. Um, so this is a cool way to share, and I can see a world where people are tweeting and blogging and posting little config stuff they've done and um, let people share it that way. So that's one way to share, uh, pretty easy to use. Um, for what it's worth, I didn't even include a slide by this. You could also use the UI that Mo showed to do the import, where if you have five files, you could just go to single import one, two, three, four, five times. Totally possible. Second um, way you can share sort of config, and this gets a little more in the developer world, but if you write your own custom module, you can actually provide new configuration defaults for the site. So you basically make a, a folder, a config install, and you put all the YAML files for the default for your module there. So if I'm shipping a cool module that does an awesome slideshow, I want to make sure all the config is right, I can put my default config in that directory, and then everybody gets it. And that's pretty cool. Um, this can't be, I can't override existing config this way, but I can add new config, which is pretty awesome. So I can share my config that way. Modules can have their defaults. Um, and that's neat. That works way better than like a variable get with like a default value that's a second argument that has to be always put in all the time. It, um, you just put it in this way. 
The limitation, though, of this, and this is very important, for if you install a module with default config, it'll only read that configuration one time at the beginning. It'll take the default and it'll put it in. But if you get a new version of the module, or maybe they change the description to make it better, you won't get that, that, that new, that new uh, configuration. It's a one-time only operation. Luckily, there is a module that will not make it a one-time only operation. Uh, uh, mod proj uh, module config update. Config update will allow you, as a module maintainer, to have a module with config that will get um, if you update the config, it'll actually give you some, some interactive ability to then continually update that configuration. And that's pretty cool. You can have a custom module for your site that has some default config that you can keep updating, which is really awesome. And this module is the foundation for coming full circle in this talk to features module, which does exist for Drupal 8, is actually pretty cool. And the stuff I point out here is that unlike Drupal, the Drupal 7 version where features has sort of its own system, if you look in the menu of this, uh, of this thing, features is actually sitting in the configuration management menu. You have synchronized, which most showed, single import export, full import export, and features, that it's working with the configuration management system. So features is a lot smaller than it is in Drupal 7 because it doesn't have to do CRUD operations. It doesn't need to export or import its own stuff. All features does is use the config update process to update default config and allows you to make stuff like, to make actual features. Here's my article system, here's my new system. So if you are a person who likes features and uses it to actually share configuration between sites, this is still possible using configuration management. And in my view, it's better because features can, doesn't have to work with all the weird exceptions, just uses the config API. So a big picture before I take a few questions. I feel this is going to change how you do development. It's going to allow a lot of new things for developers to use. It'll make things like continuous integration much easier. It'll make accountability and these other things real for your projects. And that hopefully this talk has helped you to, you know, get a little more love for configuration management and make sure that it's your, um, you know, favorite and best feature in Drupal 8 because it's something I believe we'll all use. And if you like what we're talking about and are more of a developer and building your own modules, Totally check out the great Alex Pot session tomorrow, which he's going to talk more about configuration management, but he's going to get more into the developer kind of, kind of stuff. What's a configuration entity? You know, how do I write modules with this? Um, how do I deal with schemas? And getting to sort of some of the more nitty gritty about using it on a site. So if you want more configuration management, Alex is one of the co-maintainers of the system. He also knows a bunch of stuff. So definitely, definitely check that out tomorrow. Other than that, uh, we both thank you for your attention, and we'll take a couple of questions that people have it about our favorite system in Drupal 8. Thank you. Yeah, I'll kick it off then. Um, what about when you don't want the configuration to be exactly the same on your live side, on your dev side? Your uh, all the servers might have a different uh, host name. Your uh, don't want to push things actually to MailChimp whenever you touch a button in your test site and send out 20,000 newsletters. You want to, um, yeah, so a couple of things which Alex will also talk about is all of the configuration, man all the configuration, ma great question also, by the way. All the configuration management can be overridden in settings.php. So for example, you have like an, uh, uh, some sort of API key that's supposed to be different in, in test and dev than in live. You can just, in, in the settings.php for those environments, use, you know, dollar site configuration and then the values. And you can override it on a per site basis using settings.php. And that's a good way if you have sort of some differences there um, to deal with it. Yeah, just the, the default settings.php in Drupal 8 actually references settings.local.php. Um, so you're welcome to put local changes there um, for just that environment. Um, uh, right here. I'll, I can repeat the question if you just ask it. Yeah. Okay, so the question was, is there still a place for hook update n? And uh, the example was deleting a content type. Um, 
Okay, well, there's definitely still hook update and still exists in Drupal, and you're welcome to use it for arbitrary updates, um, including things related to configuration if you so choose. Um, uh, the specific example about updates, uh, uh, content types. Content types are stored only in configuration. There's no other way to do it. Um, so if it, defears, if it disappears from your Git directory, your staging directory, and you do an import, that content type is definitely gone. And not only is it gone, anything that depended on that content type is also gone. Okay, so uh, it, I didn't show this in the demo, but if you delete a content type in Drupal 8, there's a new section called configuration deletions. And it will show you that such and such field are going to go away. My, that blog, if I deleted the blog content type, the, um, the view would go away. So uh, Drupal 8 is quite good at tracking dependencies like that. And it will keep your Drupal site very clean should you choose to delete something. So um, that's something to keep in mind there. So how would you handle multi-sites? Is there like an inheritance system for like a base uh, config folder and with uh, all the sub-sites reading out just this changed stuff, not from the settings PHP file? Okay, good question. Um, so uh, the staging folder that we've selected, sites default config, um, is multi-site friendly. So um, each of your multi-sites will have one of those. So site slash site two, uh, slash config would be the next uh, config, config folder and so on. So everyone gets their own folder in, in Git. Um, I think you were starting to allude to the next level of complexity, which is about how do I share my config across my multi-sites. Um, and I, I don't have an answer for that one. Um, right now, uh, they all are different, essentially. They're all different folders in your Git. I think you can do some Git ninja work to try to ha be, make them not be different or symlinks so that they're not different. Um, I think that you are in real trouble uh, and in super ninja land if you go that way. Um, but you know, you guys are smart, so you'll figure it out. Actually, another question then about um, uh, the configuration scope. Uh, today on our Drupal site, seven site, we use panels a lot. Uh, that's configuration, I guess, when you use the blocks in Drupal 8, I've not really looked into it. Um, is it the, the, in configuration where we, this block is on this page and it's configured like this? Yeah, so like the, as I said, the line between content configuration can get a little blurry um, uh, for it. And I, I, I wouldn't propose to know exactly all of the different different things, but something like, you know, the specific maybe callbacks in, in page manager would be configuration, but maybe the individual, you know, content that we're placing in the panel may be config or something like that. Um, the, the, line, the line is a little bit arbitrary just because people use Drupal in different ways. Like I've seen taxonomy terms, for example, be like structural parts of the site configuration. That's like how it is designed, but Drupal 8 will treat it that way. So. Yeah, I just wonder, uh, we have the front page, it uh, changes about uh, 10 times a day. Uh, they want to move a block around, feature a larger article instead of a small one. And uh, if I have to say to, 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 to my editors, stop working on that part because we're going to make some changes in configuration. Uh, we'll have it through testing and staging and in release in about three days. Uh, they're going to be mad at me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I think... Um, if you want it to be auditable and testable, then you put it in config. And if that's actually a bad thing because of the speed of, um, that you need to change it, maybe it's not a good idea. So I think we'd really have to ask the panels folks how they're architecting panels for Drupal 8 and what is config and what isn't. I'm not too familiar with how that's going at that level anyway. Cool. Yes, sir? Yeah, so the, the question is, if I change a field name for, you know, reasons I might want to change a field name, how do we handle that in configuration management? Because this could cause some trouble. Um, I think my first gut would be, like, renaming field, field names, especially machine names, is a little tricky anyway in Drupal. It's not something I probably would recommend. I'd change the label, for sure. But this could be a situation where if you do need to change a field name, 
um, that this isn't where you could use like a hook update end function because configuration management won't support that operation for you. But what you could do is, as part of the update process, you could do actually some readjustment as well. Um, all of the configuration management stuff that we're showing, like config import, config export, all uses the configuration API. And you could actually call those operations outside of the module and outside of Drush. And so you could write logic that says, hey, get this, data, get this config, change it in this way, resave it, modify the data. That's a more advanced operation, but um, I would say you can definitely use the configuration API to do, do all this, all the stuff in your own code that we're showing in the demo as you like it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just add that um, like in Drupal 7, the field API completely denies you the ability to rename a field name. Uh, it, do, it doesn't know how to migrate your data from one table to the other, and so it just denies it. So uh, like in Drupal 7, you're on your own if you want to do that operation. Um, so. um, other than that, we thank you all for coming to this talk. We're around all conference. And uh, if you have questions, questions, just come up here. We'll keep chatting. But um, everybody have a fantastic DrupalCon. <laughs>